Welcome to, this is actually week 16 of our uh, Bible study into the book of Revelation that we call Uncookifying the book of Revelation. That's because we try to uh, use common sense approach to uh, maybe, well, not maybe, the most difficult book to understand in the uh, entire Bible. So tonight is uh, almost like two Bible studies in one. We are going to finish up the sixth trumpet, and, and that is going to be uh, a nasty, um, uh, I don't know how to use nasty, it's going to be an evil um, um, an event, and then we are going to jump right into chapter 10, and we're going to begin, and I thought, I, I honestly was naive to think that we might get through chapter 10 and start into chapter 11 tonight until I started studying out. And I'll just go ahead and tell you that I took an odd turn. I didn't know that there was controversy in chapter 10. So I had to study it out to find out what, what my thought process or how I, how I view chapter 10. And I made it to like verse three. So we, it, tonight's gonna be a Bible turner or a page turner. I need to kind of get started. We got a lot to do. So uh, uh, here we go. Let's pray. That, by the way, I've named tonight's Bible study and I'm gonna do my best because I'm not real good at, at Hebrew, but it is Malach uh, Yahweh, which is the angel of the Lord. So that's, that's when we're gonna hit chapter 10. So Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for all my brothers and sisters who's come out tonight. And thank you for the, for the ones that are watching on the internet, via the Facebook and YouTube, Lord, ask you that you open up our hearts and our minds to your throne, your word. You speak directly to us, Lord. These good folks don't need to hear a word that I have to say. And it's not promised in the word that I can say. I can, I can bestow upon them any kind of knowledge or understanding. The promise from your word is that you will give us the Holy Spirit and he will guide us and direct us. And it even says that he will tell us what the future is. So we're asking you, Father, for that. Send the Holy Spirit. Let him speak to each and every one of us, Father, because, again, each one will hear what they need to hear from you. So we love you. This is to give you honor and respect. And, and we just thank you for all the good things you do for us. And in Jesus name. Amen. amen. All right. So let's jump in. Oh, let me, let me do a real quick review so we can get there. And I say quick and it's only that's kind of a funny thing. But OK, look, I got this chart. Kind of handed them out for you that are on, on the internet. You just kind of have to do the best you can do with it. I try to put the picture up once in a while. But I start here at the seven year tribulation. That begins with the Antichrist signing a uh, seven year peace treaty with the nation of Israel. And in my opinion, and we went through this for a couple of weeks, that I believe that that Antichrist, he's, he will come out of the old Ottoman Empire or the Muslim Caliphate. And uh, I believe more specifically from the Turkey area that he's going to he's going to be able to sign a peace treaty with the uh, nation of Israel that they can build a temple on the Temple Mount. And that's what the, the, the beginning of the seven years is going to be. The second seal is kind of there in the middle. So you could say what uh, year, year and a half, two years, is there's going to be war breakout. Because if you remember right, and you just know that I'm right when I say this, it says that he's going to sign this peace treaty, that there'll be peace, 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 peace is what they'll be talking about. But it will be short lived because he will go to war against other nations to gain control. He's going to build an empire, a a beast uh, of an empire. So that's going to be war. Uh, the king of the north versus the king of the south. King of the north is from Turkey area. Can't say just right at it, but it, it does say that the king of the south is Egypt. So if you picture that on a map, uh, Israel falls right in the middle. So they're, they're caught between this, this fight. Um, third one is famine. That's no brainer, kind of comes with war. And then there was death and we kind of did this population thing. We're going to continue that tonight where it said, um, what was it? A, a fourth of the world's population dies in this war in the famine and death. Fourth of the world's population. And we will see those numbers here in a minute or in a little bit. 
Seal number five is when the, because it, it begins here at the, at the midway point, the Antichrist, he's going to go against the country of Israel. He's going to stop uh, the sacrifices. We're going, to, we're going to dive more deeply into the new temple and the, and the sacrifices that goes on because the Christian world, how do we view this? How do we view them uh, making a sacrifice? Is that sacrilegious that you sacrifice the animal for your sins? So anyways, we're, that's what we're going to do next week. But that starts at that three and a half year mark. Almost you're right on the point. Three and a half year mark. Seal number five is whenever he can't get to the nation of Israel, he turns against her children, which is the church. He will start martyring the Christians in, in mass numbers. Um, six is uh, so so let me back up just a little bit whenever he blows the the uh well whenever he opens up the the sixth seal and then we begin revelation chapter eight um it takes off with this or i think it's when i said eight let me go back and look yeah um they start it starts off with this angel with, a, with an incense uh, burner. It's a ball on a chain, okay? incense burner. It says that it's full of the prayers of the saints. This angel picks this incense burner up, takes it to God's throne, opens it up, and pours out the prayers of the saints, the martyred saints. They're praying, Lord, when are you going to avenge us? He pours out those, those prayers in front of God's throne. Then he picks up hot coals from the altar in the temple of God. We're going to talk about temples next week because there's more than one temple here. But he picks up the temples, the coals from the altar, puts it inside the incense burner and throws it and hits the earth. Now, is that literal, symbolic? I don't know. But this is what happens whenever he throws the incense burner is seal number six. There is an earthquake. Then we start the 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 trumpet judgments. And because remember, he filled that incense burner with fire, threw it to the earth. The earth catches on fire. The first trumpet judgment, a third of the the dry land burns, a third of the trees, all the green grass. That is all meant to cripple the Antichrist because now there was already famine. Now we just burned a third of the crops of the whole world. So the next trumpet, whenever it's blown, it says that it's a third of the sea turned to blood. A third of the, the animals in the ocean, which is again a food supply, right? We eat a lot of fish and, and shrimp and lobster and all that good stuff that comes out of the sea. Tuna, you know, starkest tuna, guess where it comes from? The, the chicken of the sea, right? So they lose a third of that food supply. Plus it, it kills or it destroys a third of the ships that's on the sea. And it doesn't just say it creates a tidal wave or a tsunami. It says it turns the water into blood. So the, the next trumpet judgment is blown and a third of the water is, is the fresh water is struck again by the same sensor burner and it poisons the water makes it bitter and to the point where john uh, even names it wormwood which is a, a um, an herb that they used that was very bitter to taste so this water killed people it said it killed many people it didn't it didn't give us a percentage or a number i didn't put it in our, our population number that we're going to see here tonight but it says that that water kills a lot of people because it just took away the drinking water a third of the world's drinking water okay so the the fourth trumpet judgment was a third of the day and the night uh, uh, lost its luminaries, the stars, the sun, the moon, they lose their luminaries. I, my, in my eyes, and, and it's just how I kind of put all this together as a puzzle, doesn't mean it has to be necessarily what it is, but I think that sensor just kicks up so much dust. It says that the, the mountains will be leveled and every island will be moved, right? That's in the earthquake. 
So that kicks up all the dust and the luminary lights just can't make it through all the dust to the earth. Probably talking global cooling, right? I don't want to say, I don't want to say the ice age, but it would, it would. So anyhow, <sighs> lovely picture, isn't it? We started to the fifth trumpet. And it was the demon locusts that come out of the, the bottomless pit. And it said that the angel come down that had the key. It said he was given the key. Who gave him the key? Who has the keys? Death, hell, and the grave. Jesus. He gives this angel the key to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the bottomless pit. He opens it up and these demon locusts come out. And they are given the ability to sting, to torture people for five months. That's because I think, and it's just me putting together some stuff. I think that because whenever this, it's called the three woes or in the NLT, it's the three terrors, but it's the fifth uh, trumpet judgment. I believe whenever it blows, you're five months away from the end, the last day. So that's why they're given the abilities to torture for five months. All right, so now we're going to do another not so pretty judgment. Uh, it, it, this is evil. This is uh, uh, the hordes of, of hell, if you would like to say, coming to the earth. So we're going to begin in uh, Revelation chapter 9, and we'll read verse 13. So now that we're caught up, right, with our, with our review. So here we go. Uh, nine, so I'm looking at my notes, sorry. Revelation chapter 9, verse 13 says, Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the gold altar that stands in the presence of God. So I, I just pulled up a picture on, on Google, and it's not really like a fantastic, I'm not saying this is what it looks like, but just kind of give you an ideal of what the horns on the altar look like. They're golden horns, right? There's the four of them, one in each corner. But I didn't know this. Whenever I found this picture, it says that the horns had a purpose. And, and I don't know why I thought maybe it was to help carry the altar, because, you know, they used to carry the wilderness altar. They carried it wherever they went. But that's what the poles are for, the staffs. The horns were that, that you, if you grab the hold of the horns, and we've all heard that, or go there in prayer and intercessor and grab a hold of the horns. We don't know why we say it, but that when you get a hold of the horn, it was, you was claiming sanctuary. So in other words, if you, was, if you had people chasing you and you could make it to this altar and you could grab a hold of the horn, they couldn't pull you back out. It was sanctuary. So that's the purpose of the horns. Get a hold of the horns is, is the sanctuary in God's temple. So, uh, um, so now we have uh, uh, the, the voice that was speaking from the four from those four horns. They were speaking from the sanctuary of God. OK, and, and it's what it says it's the gold altar that stands in the presence of God. So this voice speaks from the sanctuary. I kind of wanted to stress that. Right. And. Um, yeah, we won't get in it. But again, there's more than one temple here that's going on, but, but we'll just stick with this one. Verse 14. I'm actually going to read 14, 15 and 16. It said in a voice said to the sixth angel who held the trumpet, release the four angels who were bound in the great Euphrates River. Then the, then the four angels who were, had been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one third of the people on the earth. Now, just to go back and let you remember the last trumpet, they was given restrictions. They was told not to harm the, the earth, the green grass, not that they couldn't harm any mother nature, so to say. And they wasn't to kill anybody. They was just to bring them pain for five months to torture them. Here, these four angels were released and they were given to kill one third of all the earth's population. And then it gives the instrument that they use to kill one third of the world's population. In verse 16, it says, I heard the size of their army, which was 200 million mounted troops. So 
I, I did another picture because <laughs> 200 million is, is one of those numbers that you could just throw out there, right? So I, I come up with this. This is $50 million in $100 bills. See, it's on a skid, so you can get kind of a, I picked this picture because it was on the skid. We all know how big a skid is. We can pick it up about this. So, so this pile of, of $100 bills is three and, a, three and a half feet wide. That's this way. It is two feet, eight inches in depth, length, and it is two and a half feet tall. That's $50 million in $100 bills. So in my mind, two and a half feet tall, it's only 50 million. We're talking 200 million uh, of these, this army. So that would be the same size stack of money, the same denomination, but instead of being just two and a half feet tall, times it by four, 10 feet tall. So in your bedroom, <laughs> Your, the sheetrock that's it, you know, from your floor to your ceiling, and and the standard size is eight foot. You might have you know an older house or even a newer house where you'd have maybe ten foot ceilings, but you're talking an eight foot ceiling. This is taller than you, than your bedroom ceiling. It, that's that's just trying to give you a, a, a because we save numbers like two hundred million. Oh yeah, two hundred million. We don't realize just how much that is. That's a stack of hundred dollar bills, ten foot tall three and a half foot wide, two foot eight, in, two foot eight inches deep. That's a lot of money. But I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of, of what, and, and I even seen the weight and I don't remember it, but it was in the tons of what, what $2 million would weigh. So just kind of wanted to give you a picture of what a 200 million man army, or I hate to use man, but 200 million army, what it would look like. All right. so. Uh, it said that it was given the the ability to kill one third of the people on earth. So I, I kept my my population numbers. We started out with seven billion nine hundred and seventy one million four hundred eighty six thousand um, people. That was whenever the day that I this that you know we come to. What was it? Uh, uh, seal number four. The day we come to seal four, I pulled it up on Google. World population rounded it up just a touch because it's it, it was a rolling number. Does that make sense? Like our debt clock, how it rolls, right? So the the population was continuously rolling. I just stopped it, you know. So that is there, and whenever we took a fourth of the world's population that brought us down to I'm just going to go ahead and round it off uh, as six billion people come over here to six billion that ends up being the one third so now we've we've went from almost eight to a little over four we've lost a fourth of the world's population in the fourth seal and in this trumpet judgment that's not counting the people who dies in the war not counting the people who died from drinking the bitter water, not talking about the saints that's been martyred. They're not, we're not counted into this number. This is just the, from those two. So again, just trying to give you the ideal because you know we can throw away, hey, yeah, it killed a third of the world's population. We're talking 1.8 billion people. Rounding it up just a little bit. That's way, way more than the country of the United States has in it. I forget what we was, like 350 million or something in the United States. We don't come close to that. You're talking, you know, the size of China and India or something. So, so just kind of, again, just trying to let you see the gravity and just sort of throwing numbers at you and running by it, just trying to give you some, a, 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 a picture of what that would look like and just how many people's lives that we're talking about. Are they God things? Huh? Are they God things? So the four angels, good question. The four angels who have the ability to take one third of the world's population are not, uh, uh, the question was, are they God's angels? Well, God created everything, but these are evil. 
These are evil spirits. Because here, let's let's read a little bit about their um, about their. This is their army. It says, and in my vision. Okay, so let's start right right there. John is saying, this is what I saw. He's doing the best that he can to describe something that's horrific, a, a, a demonic entity. I don't know how to say that. Right. So he's doing the very best. So when it says something like it says I, when it says something like they have something like that's that doesn't mean that's what it exactly is. He's just comparing it to something to give you a visual. So verse 17, it says in my vision, I saw the horses and riders sitting on them. So they are horses and they are riders. It says the riders wore armor that were fiery red and dark blue and yellow. The, the horses had heads like lions and fire and smoke and burning sulfur bellowed from their mouths. Now, that's not a like that. That is three things. And, and pay attention to what they are. It says they had a head like a like a lion, but they had fire and smoke and burning sulfur billowing from their mouths. Verse 18, it says, one third of all the people on the earth were killed by these three plagues. What did they die from? Fire, smoke, burning sulfur. Because it, it even says it. I got a little dash. It says they was killed by these three plagues, dash by the fire, the smoke and the burning sulfur that came from the mouths of the horses. The riders on the horses didn't even kill anybody. It's what comes out of the horses mouths. Verse 19, it says their power was in their mouths and in their tails. Now, we haven't seen the tails yet because it says next sentence, it says for the tails had heads like snakes with the power to injure people. So not only did they die from the smoke and the fire and the burning sulfur. I don't know if you've ever seen burning sulfur. I've only seen it in videos, but you don't see a flame. It's almost invisible. Now, if you did it in the dark, you might see a hit blue flame. But if I had a pile of burning sulfur, all you would see is a powder substance melting, turning to liquid. You don't even see the flame. So that's what kills the people the tails and it's and it says john's words not mine but it says the ted the tails had heads like snakes not that they were snakes but they had a heads like snakes and it says they had the power to injure people so they killed out the front injured out the back verse 20 All right. So before I read it, I just looked and, gl and, and, and glanced at it. This is the first time we see this language in the book of, of Revelation. Remember where we are in in our chart. We're all the way here. This is number six. We're at the end. We're coming to the end. Verse 20 says, but the people who did not die in these plagues still refuse to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. So all this up to here, all the way up to, to number five, God has been doing this so that they will repent. Now they're getting to the point where they are. How do you want to say it? They're angry with God for the locusts, for these um, demonic horsemen. And what do they do in their anger? They get bitter. But the people who did not die in these plagues still refused to pen of their evil deeds and turn to God. They continued to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver and bronze, stone and wood. Idols that can do neither see nor hear nor walk. Uh, um, verse 21. They did not repent of their murders or their witchcraft or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So at this point, they're just being... Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll use an Old Testament phrase. They're being stiff necked. They are uh, refusing to repent. Rebellious. All right. That's the uh, not so good half of Bible study tonight. Right. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Huh? We, we lost one point eight billion people in the earth's population. And the, the half hour I've been talking. 
So I just wanted you guys to get that grasp. And, and so look, I turned to chapter 10. So here I go. This is where I get my, my name of my Bible lesson for tonight, which is, uh, and again, I'll do the best I can. Malak, <laughs> Malak, Yahweh, the angel of the Lord. So <sighs> here I go. I didn't know that this was offensive. I have always thought of this angel in verse 10, uh, as I have read this, I have just assumed it's been Jesus. And, uh, and I'll just tell you why I get that. Because my first real deep dive into the book of Revelation was with Jack Van Impey again. I read his book, uh, um, um, Revelation Revealed. Anybody ever heard of that? No. I mean, it was a it was a big, thick paperback book that was verse by verse. He taught that this was uh, Jesus. And I, I don't remember the reasons why I don't have that book anymore. I probably loaned it to somebody like most of us do loan books and you never see him again. But um, um, I, I probably loaned that book out. Don't know where it's at. And I don't remember why he pinned Jesus on this, but I thought, I thought it was kind of a no brainer. Well, then as I start studying it and I started listening to some commentaries on it, there is Christians who says that this is sacrilegious to call it's blasphemy to call this angel Jesus. So that got my curiosity. Why was it sacrilegious? Why is it blasphemy to call this angel of the Lord, that's, that's, ex that's what those Malak, Yahweh, angel of the Lord, why is that sacrilegious? And, they, and they, their point of view is this, and, and I, I, this is where my deep dive goes. <laughs> I've only got a half an hour and I got a whole lot more Bible verses. This is my deep dive. Um, why is that sacrilegious whenever Jesus made himself lower than the angels to be a human? Right. Was that sacrilegious to think that he'd done that? Is it sacrilegious that on on the you know, what we what we call the Last Supper, the, the, the Passover before his crucifixion, that it says that he took off his clothes and put a towel around his waist and he washed the, the disciples feet. Is that sacrilegious to think that God could lower himself to that? So this was the analogy that I used to a coworker as I was talking my way through this is, look, I work construction. I, I've used jackhammers and and and, you know, impact wrenches that took three people to, to run. You had to lower it down into the pit with a with a bridge crane. Uh, Steve probably knows what I'm talking about. That's the big turbine jobs on the main stop valves. You know, I, I, I had these jobs that I felt masculine about and I would come home dirty and sweaty and construction worker, you know, and I, I raised two girls and they didn't want to play G.I. Joe and trucks and stuff like that. They wanted to play Barbies, <laughs> you know, and here I am feeling all masculine coming home from work from construction job. And guess what I did? I got down in the floor and had tea time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with a crown on my head, you know, playing playing Barbie. It's, it's what fathers do. Right. You lower yourself down to spend time to have a relationship with your children. Why is it sacrilegious to think that God would lower himself to come and have tea time <laughs> to play Barbies with mankind, to lower himself to do what? To have a relationship with his children. That makes sense. So here comes my, 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 my rant. So let's do this. Turn in your Bibles. We're going to do a lot of turning to, uh, oh, before we do, let's just read a few verses. Let me, let me do this because I don't want to keep going back to revelation. We'll just read chapters one, or chapter 10, verse one, two, and three. And that's all we're going to get done in, in revelation. And I even put this up here. Because this is what we're going to see in these three verses. These, these are the characteristics that they're calling the angel of the Lord. Okay, so here I go. Chapter 10, verses 1, 2, and 3, it says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, surrounded by a cloud, with a rainbow over his head. 
His face shone like the sun, that's S-U-N, face shone like the sun and his feet were like pillars of fire. So if you look, I've got this all right here on this list. Angel of the Lord, surrounded by uh, fire, rainbow over his head. Um, his feet were like pillars of, you know, face shone like the sun, feet like pillar of fire, verse two. And it, in his hand was a small scroll. <sighs> that had been opened. So that's what we've been doing ever since we hit Revelation chapter six, verse one, is we have been opening this scroll. That's what the seals are. Now, this is the same seal. It calls it small scroll. And I think that is in comparisons to the mighty angel. John sees this mighty angel open up his hand and there's an open scroll, right? It's not that the scroll changed size, the angel changed size. It's a mighty angel. It looks small in his hand. That's how I see this, right? Uh, it says he stood with his right foot in the sea and his left foot on the land. I got just to write his right foot, left foot. We're going to get there. Verse three, and it says he gave a great shout like the roar of a lion. We got the lion. Uh, and it says, and when he shouted, the seven thunders answered. So we are going to kind of look at all these bullets if I got the time. <laughs> so, so Exodus, go to Exodus chapter 14. We are going to begin with the angel of the Lord. Exodus chapter 14. I'm going to start in verse 10. And I'm sorry, I can't go chronological. We're going to jump around in the Bible quite a bit. Exodus 14, 10. Now, uh, uh, I'll give you just a little bit here that, that uh, yeah, everybody there. Exodus 14, 10. I'm going to read 10 through 14. It says this. As Pharaoh approached the people of Israel, we, we know the, the, the Red Sea story, but this is it. Uh, as Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, here we go. Here comes the whining part. It says, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves in Egypt? <laughs> Uh, what have you done to us? Why did you make us leave? Notice how they was begging to leave Egypt now that it's getting bad. Now, why did you make us leave Egypt? Right. Didn't we tell you that this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves in Egypt. They've been praying for you for hundreds of years to be released from Egypt. And this is now. Uh, uh, let us be slaves in Egypt. It is better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. Verse 13, it says, but Moses told the people, don't be afraid, stand up, uh, or just stand still and watch the Lord rescue, uh, rescue you today. So my main point of reading this to you is who is rescuing Israel? It says the Lord, that's Yahweh. OK, and it says the Egyptians you see today uh, will never be seen again. The Lord Yahweh, Yahweh himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. So the first thing I want you to see is it's Yahweh that is protecting them, the Lord. So turn still in Exodus, but go to chapter 23. And that should be just about five pages to your right. Exodus 23, I'm going to read... We'll start in verse 20. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm raising my hand. How many of you have that little header above your Bible verse? What's, what's it say? Mine says, a promise of the Lord's presence. So we're still talking Yahweh. Okay, now, now, now listen closely and I hope you get what, what I'm talking about here. It says, see, I am sending an angel before you. So there is, I've listened to hours, not this week, but I've listened to hours of commentaries on, on this uh, uh, Malach and Yahweh and how it, it, it 
discusses both of them in the same verses and it kind of merges them together. Now, don't get me wrong when I say this. We believe there's only one God. There is no other God. Monotheistic, I think, is the word that we're looking for. There is only one God. But he chooses to be in a trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we're talking Yahweh, in, in my mind, I think of the Father, and this Malach as being Jesus. And it, it, the, the lines are so blurry that sometimes you can't figure out which one is which. Because see, it's the Lord who protects them. It's the Lord that goes before them. Now they're getting an angel that goes before them. And, and you know, Jesus, here I go. I, I know you just, you just know that I believe this. Jesus said, no man has ever seen the Father. But if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now there's, there's instances, I, I don't know how many, but there's all kinds of instances in the Bible in the Old Testament where God takes on a human form. And, and you know, Adam and Eve heard him walking through the garden. Uh, he came and had dinner with, with Abraham. It, wasn't, it didn't say Yahweh did. It said Malach, Yahweh, come and, and told Abraham he was going to destroy uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm using that instance because he sat and ate with them. They ate a goat, <laughs> right? Jacob wrestled with Malach, Yahweh. And wrestled with him all night long. Remember, we talking about getting down on the floor and playing Barbie with your kids. He came and he wrestled Jacob and allowed Jacob to win. How many of you have ever let kids beat you at Candyland or, or shoots and ladders or what? You're right. He let him win until, you know, till till the angel of the Lord got tired, broke his hip, and got up and said, "Okay, you know, we're going to change your name." Right. So, so there's all kinds of instances. Whenever you hear that that the Lord's going to protect you with the strong right hand, that is a human, a human aspect. That's that's not God the Father. We're talking about Malach, the angel. Uh, um, let us make man in our image. All right. So, so. Uh, let me get back to my Bible verse because I ain't even read it yet. All right. Um, back to uh, verse one. It says, no, not verse one. Verse 20. Yeah. OK. Got to find it myself. Verse 20 it says, see, I am sending an angel before you to protect you. Who was going to protect Israel? Remember, I just read it to you. The Lord. I am sending an angel before you to protect you on your journey and lead you safely to the place that I have prepared for you. Pay, pay close attention. Now, now remember that, that God the Father spoke over Jesus' life. Was it three times? I know, I know of two I can think of, uh, of whenever Jesus was baptized in Mount Transfiguration. For sure, God spoke over him. This is my son who, who I'm well pleased. It's the same verbiage. He says, pay close attention to him and obey his instructions. Do not rebel against him, for he is my representative and he will not forgive your rebellion. Now, uh, just ask yourself, is there an angel in heaven that has the ability to forgive sin? Uh, let me read on just a little bit. Verse 22, it says, but if you are careful to obey him, follow all my instructions. So see how it blurs the lines? Now we have obey him and follow my instructions. See, it's it, it almost, you can't even hardly decipher which one's the angel and which one's God here. Uh, but if you are careful to obey him, follow all my instructions, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and I will oppose those who oppose you for my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Parasites, Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites, so that you may live there and I will destroy them completely. Verse 24, and then we stop. You must not worship their gods. See, they have gods. You must not worship their gods. That's a lowercase g of the nations or serve them in any way or imitate their evil practices. Instead, you must utterly destroy them and smash their sacred pillars. I would love to take a Bible lesson and discuss the gods of the other nations. All right. But, but, but this is not now. But I just wanted you to see just from those few verses that 
It was the angel that God said, I'm going to go before you. I'm going to protect you. And then it's a, it's an angel. Right. So real quick, one more point. Go to Acts chapter seven. And I want to show you something that Charlton Heston missed. Now, <laughs> I've actually had arguments, not arguments, um, debates over people seeing God the Father because Jesus just to me, to me plainly says no man has seen this, the Father so you know again my, my little ditty that I do either he's crazy he's a liar or he's telling the truth I choose to believe that wherever Jesus spoke he's telling the truth when he said no man has seen the Father no man has seen the Father right I've had that I've had argument over this Bible verse I'm getting ready to read you not argument a discussion. <laughs> Christian folks debating it, right? So here I go. I'm going to read Acts chapter 7, um, starting in verse 30. Acts 7, 30. All right. So uh, to kind of give you a, um, give you what's going on here, because we're just jumping in the middle of this. This is, this is Stephen talking right he's the first martyr after for, of the church verse 30 it says 40 years later in the desert near mount sinai an angel appeared to moses now now what what appeared to moses in mount sinai this is 40 years after he was run out of egypt for killing an egyptian is what it's saying what what did he see in in the ten commandments seen a burning bush right this is what charlton heston missed Verse 30 again, it says, 40 years later in the desert near Mount Sinai, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush. So what was in the middle of that bush? The angel of the Lord, the, the actual verbiage, Malak, Yahweh. All right. Verse 30, it says, when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight and he went to, the, to take a closer look and the voice of the Lord called out to him. So now this angel that's in the middle of the bush speaks to him and it says, I am God. I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. See, so that shouldn't be so, so blasphemy is what people will say it's blasphemy to think that this could be Jesus but Jesus is the one who he was whenever he was on the earth he said hey before Abraham was I am right so so Moses shook with terror and he did not dare look um yeah, let's read a couple more verses. It says, then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. I have, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and I have heard their groans and have come to rescue them. Remember back, we just read the groans where they said we wanted to be slaves in Egypt, <laughs> right? So, but this is God speaking. He said, I have heard their groans and I have come down to rescue them. Now go and I am sending you back to Egypt, right? So we kind of know the rest of the story. Moses like is like, yeah, who me? I'm not qualified. I stutter. Da, 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 da. So anyways, I just wanted you to see that the bush wasn't on fire. The angel was on fire. The bush was not consumed by the fire. So God speaking, right? It, it blurred the lines between who this angel is and God speaking. So can I just say the angel of the Lord is, is, is Malak Yahweh and he's God. And I'm not talking that there's two gods. That's just how, how it is. I don't, I don't want to get into the Trinity thing. All right. So moving on, I got lots more as you can see and like 12 minutes to do it. So I wanted to do this surrounded by a cloud. And I think it was like week three. I did. Jesus was the was the cloud rider. All right. Because our, our verse said that he, he he was clothed in a cloud. And I have seen a picture of this giant angel standing one foot in the sea one on the land. And he had looked like a tutu of a cloud around him. Right. That's that's not the 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 the. The picture, the word picture that John's given you, it's just that he's in the clouds. He's not wearing a little fuzzy cloud around his waist, right? Right? 
we're not talking white fluffy clouds. And I, I might have to end after the cloud and we'll, we'll finish this list next week. So let's, let's do the cloud thing. So I, and, and do you see, I kind of really got caught up into this. <laughs> um, let's go back to Exodus, this time chapter 19. Exodus 19. Because this is the first place we start seeing God in the clouds. The angel of the Lord, Moach, Yahweh. Now, I know I'm not doing a good job. It's more of a spitting sound. Moach, right? Moach, Yahweh. But, but anyhow, um, Exodus chapter 19. I'm going to start in verse 16. Exodus 19, starting in verse 16. So um, um, Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, verse 16. I'll just tell you that this is what happens right before they get the Ten Commandments, right? So here we go. Verse 16, it says, On the morning on the third day, thunder roared and lightnings flashed and a dense cloud came down on the mountain. Now, picture what I just said. Thunder, lightning, a dense cloud. Is that that white fluffy cloud that you see floating on a nice blue sky. Okay. There was a long, loud blast of Iran's horn and all the people trembled. Moses led them out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. Fluffy cloud. The smoke billowed in the sky like smoke from a brick kiln. And then the whole mountain shook violently. The blast of the ram's horn growed louder and louder. Moses spoke and God thundered his reply. Verse 20. It says, um, it says, the Lord came down on top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed the mountain. When the Lord told Moses, go back down and warn the people not to break through the boundaries to see the Lord or they will die. Okay. Now, this started me for a loop. I had to read it a few times before it made sense to me. And it'll make sense soon as I say this. But um, Moses is getting ready to protest. Verse 22, it says, even the priests who regularly come near the Lord must purify themselves so that the Lord does not break out and destroy them. But Lord, Moses protested, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai. You warned us. You told me, mark off the boundary all around the mountain to set it apart as holy. So this was the protest. And I had to read it a few times. Moses hiked up this mountain, Mount Sinai, to see God, the smoke, the billowing smoke, the fire, the thunders. He, he crawls up there and God says, now go back down and tell, you, tell the people not to come up. Now, the protest was, look, Lord, I don't have to do that. You've already told me not to. They, they know not to come up. Right? I don't have to go down there and tell them they already know that. And God says, no, go down and tell them. Because if they, if they break through the boundary, if they even touch the mountain, this is verbiage the first time if they even touch the mountain that he'll he'll break out utterly destroy him right so that was the protest just so you know i'm gonna read just a few more verses but verse 24 it says but the lord said go down and bring aaron back with you in the meantime do not let the priests or the people break through to approach the lord or he will break out and destroy them so who's he when the lord's talking did you know that did you notice that um, it says, do not break through or approach the Lord or he will break out and destroy them. So uh, uh, this this Malach, Yahweh and God, both at the same place. Verse 25, it says, so Moses went down to the people and told them what the Lord had said. So I, I'm really just doing the clouds. I want you to see that whenever it talks about this angel standing with one foot in the sea and one on the land, that he doesn't have his white puffy tutu on. We're talking fire and smoke, bellowing smoke. It's going to be a sight. It isn't going to be cool. Oh, yeah, you look. The people trembled. Okay, so let, let's let's keep going. And and again, if you don't know, 
the next thing that happens is Moses and Aaron goes back up and they get the Ten Commandments. Okay, so we're moving on. Psalms chapter 68. Psalm 68. And as you turn there, I want, I want to emphasize again why I'm doing this. Because in my mind, I do believe that this mighty angel is Jesus. And this is all characteristics. That's the word I used. Characteristics of whenever Jesus shows up. Even in the, in the Old Testament, when he shows up, fire and smoke. Okay? So, um, Psalms chapter 68, I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. I'm sorry, 68. Thank you. Psalms chapter 68. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. Here I go. Rise up, O God. Notice who's rising up. Rise up, O God, and scatter your enemies. Let those who hate God run for their lives. We, we're, this is in time language. Blow them away like smoke. Melt them like wax in a fire. Let the wicked perish in the presence of God, but let the godly rejoice. Let them be glad in God's presence. Let them be filled with joy. Sing praises to God and to his name. Sing loud praises to him who rides in the clouds. Everybody see that? His name is the Lord. So we're talking God. This, that's a very uh, uh, human-like characteristic to ride in the clouds. So, we, and, and I, I'm going to take you to Daniel, and it shows exactly who the cloud rider is. But, but uh, um, sing loud praises to him who rides in the clouds. His name is the Lord. Rejoice in his presence. And I'm just going to read a few more verses because it's so beautiful. He's a father to the fatherless, defender of the widows. This is God whose dwelling is holy. God places the lone, lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy, and he makes the rebellious lived in a sun-scorched land. So, uh, again, I just wanted you to see this verbiage of, of God riding in the clouds, right? Moving on. Let's, let's do Daniel real quick. Daniel 7. And I know I've read this more than once in this Bible study, but this is just so important. Daniel 7, I'm going to start in verse 19. Now, just give you a reminder from the, the first week, whenever it said, or the third week, whenever it says son of man as bar, bar Adam, bar Adam, the son of man, Right? That's not offensive. I'm a bar Adam. You're a bar Adam. We're a son of a man. Right? So, so uh, we're a son of, we're, we're in the lineage of Adam. But this chapter was written in Aramaic, which was Aramaic, Aramaic, which was what the language that the Babylonians spoke. That's where Daniel is at. That's not bar Adam. That is bar Anash. The only time it's used in the Old Testament. And, and this is what it says. Let's, let's read the bar Anash. It's, I'm going to start in verse 9 so we can see God the Father. To show you that we're not talking about one. We're talking about the Lord Yahweh. And then we're going to talk about another Yahweh. Don't, don't think I'm thinking of two different gods. <laughs> Same God. Verse 9, it says, I watched his thrones were put in place and the ancient one set down the judge. That's God the Father, the ancient one. Set down the judge. His clothing was white as snow and his hair was a pure wool. Boy, those are human characteristics though, aren't they? He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood more to attend him. And the courts began its session and the books were opened. Court is starting. The judgment on the Antichrist kingdom, the, the fourth beast as, as it is. So, but this is what happens. Verse 11, I continued to watch because I heard a little horn's boastful spe speech. I kept watching until the fourth beast was killed and its body was destroyed by fire. The other three beasts had their authority taken from them. 
but they were allowed to live a little while longer. I, I've explained that. Don't want to go back into it again. But verse 13, as my vision continued that night, I saw someone like the son of man, the Baranash coming on the clouds of heaven. So this this was to be tied in with with uh, Psalm 68, the, the rider on the clouds. Right. Uh, um, it says coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient one. So so you, we can see that this is two different entities. Can you not? This cloud rider, the Baranash, he approaches the ancient one and was led into his presence. Verse 10, he was given authority, honor, sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that the people of every race, nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. So we have the ancient one and we have the cloud rider. Two distinct possible uh, 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 different entities. I don't know how to keep saying that. The cloud rider, the Baranash. And that's what, again, whenever they drug Jesus off into Caiaphas' house, the, the head priest, and they said, are you the Messiah? And he said, I'm the Baranash. He, he quoted himself as being this prophecy that Daniel spoke. That's why he rent his, his robe and was mad. He goes, why do you need to hear anything else? You heard it from his own mouth. Remember, they was trying to find false witnesses. He said, you, what do we need false witnesses for? You've heard him say that. He's saying he's the bar Nash. He's saying he's the cloud rider. He didn't say I'm bar Adam. I'm, I'm the son of Joseph. He said, I'm the son of God, the one who, who is going to judge the nations, the rule of the nations. So that's what made him so mad. So I see this language here in Revelation where he's, he's clothed in a cloud. Why is it blasphemy to think that it's Jesus? So one more, we'll go back to Revelation and then we'll call it an evening. And I'll, I'll continue to pick back up with the rainbow. All right, so let's, let's go to Revelation chapter one first. And I'll, I'll, I'll briefly mention the rainbow. Revelation chapter one, I'm only gonna read one verse. If you don't want, if you're tired of turning by now, you just wanna listen. <laughs> so, Revelation chapter one, verse seven. This is all talking about Jesus. You'll see this in the verse that it has to be talking about Jesus. Revelation chapter one, verse seven. It says, look, he comes on the clouds of heaven. So how does he come on the clouds? How does our mighty angel all the way back in, in chapter 10 clothed in a cloud? He comes with the cloud of heaven and everyone will see him. <laughs> Again, it isn't some secret event that happens that nobody, everybody wakes up in the morning and go, what happened? Everybody will see him and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. Even, right, we, we know now that we're talking about Jesus. No, no questions. It says even those who pierced him. It's talking about the, the nation of Israel, the, the Jews. They will... They will even see him and all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes and amen. So, so be it. It's going to happen. So Jesus is the one who comes in the cloud. And, and I know I went in and I got more and we're going to do these other ones because I just found this so fascinating. I hope you did too. hope I didn't bore you to death. But why is it sacrilegious to think that that caused the verbiage it said a mighty angel that it's that it's blasphemy to say that that's Jesus. I just don't get it. And I'm telling you, it was adamant about it. To think that God would lower himself down to the status of a mighty angel. I thought he's done a lot more than that. He's done that for us. So. So. Um, Next week, we'll remind me, we'll take back, we'll read those three verses again. We'll take back off at Rainbow. But if you don't know, I, I've seen it uh, like half a dozen times on Facebook today. And I'm not a Facebook stroller. Uh, is that even a word? I don't sit down and just scroll through Facebook. Uh, if it isn't like my name attached to it, where it comes to me in my notifications nine times out of ten I'm not going to see it I just don't do that 
Uh, there's too much negativity on Facebook. I, ch- I want to use it for a positive influence and, and prayer requests and stuff like that's all great. And uh, I've been praying for some of you guys and your families, just to let you know because of what I see on Facebook and, and our prayer chains through Facebook. That's all good stuff. But I but if you post something on Facebook and you get mad because I don't respond or like it or say something to you about it, I didn't see it. <laughs> I just don't do that. But I have seen it just seems like it's been popping up is that is the month of June is like rainbow month. Is that my right on that? And it, and it isn't what the world sees as what the rainbow represents. So I guarantee you, I heard a few snickers. Look, I'm on, I'm on Facebook right now. And if I was to put a big rainbow flag behind me as I taught Bible study, that, that would have a different meaning than what we think it should. <laughs> so... So, but, but, but see that, that I, I'm, I'm just my opinion, that's wrong. We need to take back that symbol. And that's what it is. It, it is a covenant sign. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to begin because this mighty angel, ha- is, he's got a halo on his head, or not a halo, he's got a rainbow on his head, right? I thought of myself, I've got this goofy, not Tom, I got this goofy headband. It's the rainbow collars. Right. I thought about wearing it, except for it's got the hair coming off the back. You guys seen that for bald people, right? So, but if I would, again, if I had a big rainbow flag behind me or a rainbow headband on, like this mighty angel's got a he- rainbow, see this evil, wicked world sees it as being something that God calls an abomination. So it's not supposed to be. This is the very first covenant God made with mankind. I'm making a covenant. And the sign of that covenant is going to be the rainbow. So why would you not think that this mighty angel that's got a rainbow on his head, why wouldn't you think that's Yahweh? That is that is Malach, Yahweh, right? So. That's, we're going to we're going to look at those again tomorrow or next week and we'll we'll finish off this list and um, we'll jump into the little scroll. Well, I, I don't have anything on the little scroll in my notes. So let me say it like this. Next week, my plan is we will finish off chapter 10 out of the book of Revelation and then we can begin chapter 11. I'm really excited for chapter 11. If you couldn't tell, I got excited about this one. But I'm excited about Revelation 11 because I want to I want to do that measuring the temple stuff. And we're going to talk about temples because there's there's more than one temple. So here we go. Father, we love you and we thank you for all the good things you do for us. Thank you for the revelation. Yes, we started out talking about these uh, um, four evil angels and the army that they used to kill a third of the earth. But then we went quickly into talking about our favorite subject, the, the, the real revelation of this letter, of this Bible study, that we are revealing the mighty angel, the, 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 the Malach uh, Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, as being Jesus. And Father, I've seen the countenance on the faces change from, from going from doom and gloom, killing what what we say 1.7 billion people on the earth or something like that i forget the number but we, we had that and we went to smiling about jesus and and the mighty awesome presence father allow us to never get into the to the you know jesus is my homeboy or jesus is my my sensei or we start taking this flippant look at who he really is the baranash that comes in bellowing smoke and fire on the mountain. May we have complete awe and and reverence for you. So we love you. I ask you that you help us uh, uh, with all the daily struggles in our lives. There's, we still fight COVID here and there and all the other things that's going on. And, and, and uh, just help us put the kingdom of God first and you'll take care of the junk. And, uh, I, I, maybe I shouldn't be, maybe I shouldn't call it junk, but, but Lord, uh, it's stuff. And the more that we dive into who you are, how great you are, and what our place is in you, 
we do see, start to see that stuff is just being stuff. So we love you, Lord, and be with us until we come back again next week. Love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Thank you, guys.